Is there anything you can't do musically? Oh, man. Oh, man. I mean, There's so on. many things I can't do. No, but I mean, you, you, you compose, right? I mean, your performance as a player it is unequaled. Um, I mean, any directions in music that you want to take that you're holding back from? You're not quite ready? Oh, many. Well, I want to learn to orchestrate for a big band. I want yeah. to learn to write for an orchestra. I want to learn more about the histories of different musics to combine the musics at the root. Like, it's kind of like the world, move, world music movement that you see, yeah. which actually is what jazz is. And this right. is something that Duke Ellington did a lot of with things like the Far East Suite and uh, other pieces that he wrote to try to combine, to have an intensity of relationships from different historic periods. Picasso really did that a lot in his paintings. Like it, there's so many relationships going on with the history of that art. So it, it, art is a, is a limitless field. You have people like Bach, Beethoven, Ellington, Louis Armstrong, and someone like me is not even on the, I mean, I'm not even scratching the surface of what an art has to offer. And in these modern times, there's so many things of interest and beauty is so many struggles, so much pain, so much joy in the world that if, if you try to come to grips with any percentage of that, it just takes a long time to develop. Why do you do you play every day? Uh, well, sometimes I miss a day. Yeah, but, but, but I always miss play in my mind. Yeah, <laughs> I, I wake up in the morning. I'm thinking of music. How to how to give a more comprehensive and a statement with some more beauty and some joy and some love in it. I, I never. There's never a time that that's not on my mind. Yeah. Ever all day when I'm going to bed in the morning when I when I, if I'm meeting someone. Always, it's always focus on and the music. And who influences you the most? Everybody. Beyond all the people we talk about, I mean, beyond the, the old masters and, and Duke and Louis Armstrong and... You know, last night, Mal uh, last night I called two kids, one in Milwaukee and yeah. another one in Pennsylvania. One was 13 and one was 15. And they you called them? I called them, yeah, I get messages from them. Right. Sometimes it takes me three months to call them back. And the 13-year-old kid says, yeah, I was listening to your album, City Movement. How, what is your conception of composition when you write a long piece like that? That sounds like something I'd ask. You know yeah. what I'm and the 15-year-old kid says, well, man, man the, the, you know, the 15-year-old yeah. kid says, man, it, it's very little uh, people who are interested in playing the real jazz music with the soul and the feeling and who want to swing. Mm -hmm. and I had a conversation with a 15-year-old kid's mother, and she's trying to send them to school, and they don't have anything. They live in a kind of a rural area. And she, she, one of her kids, her, her older sons, is going to move to another city so that his younger brother can have a chance to play in a music ensemble. So when you have these type of experiences, it just it makes you realize the greatness and the power of music and it just, just makes you grateful for the chance to interact with people. And, and You feel the responsibility because you sense your own self in this long connection from all the, you know, th th that you, because of the gifts you have and because of the family you have and because of, of the acceptance you have that you've got some responsibility to give. Well, you, it's not really that, because it's not like you feel a responsibility to give. It's just that you feel that you are just a part of something, that is, you have the opportunity to be a part of something that is about what life is. Well, but is there something, the community of music, or is it something larger than the it's community larger of culture? Than, it's just a community of culture. Like, it's not even that I, I could talk to this kid or that he would be talking to me. But just in, in the 15-year-old kid actually asked me about another young kid, isn't it, a guy named Nicholas Payton who's a young trumpet player, who's like 20 years old, 19 yeah. years old, who yeah. really can play. And a 15-year-old kid from Pennsylvania says, well, I want to know how I can play like Nicholas Payton. <laughs> and I remember Nicholas Payton when he was 14 years old and he would come to my house. And yeah. It's just in, in every field we have this type of continuity. Yeah. It's just that I, I'm in the field of music, of course. And just what inspires me is the fact that the music has a positive influence on people's lives and it makes people strive for something more sophisticated and desire to be more of a part of a community and it, it, it doesn't make people want to be destructive or vulgar toward each other but it inspires learning and it inspires yeah. a certain type of love and feeling. What do you do to make, I mean take the inner city schools for example, are you doing anything to reach out to those kids and somehow say not only here, here's a role model, you know, you, but also here I want to be I want to be a teacher. I want you to know about Louis Armstrong. I want you to understand what this hero. Yeah, I, I do that. I want you to know about Charlie Parker, and I want you to know about. I do that, but I'm always frustrated because I feel like I'm I'm on the battlefield with a BB gun, fighting against people with atomic bombs. 
And who because are they? What's, who's the atomic bomb people? The people. Just who? all the ignorance on television, the vulgarity, the lack of respect for people, and it, that's what has the attention of the teenagers. Because you know, when you're 13 yeah, or 14, whenever you yeah. see like some vulgarity or some ignorance, you kind of gravitate toward that. I know yeah. I did. Right. Yeah. And you can't. It, it's like a it's a, a great struggle because the the powers that be, the cultural forces in the in the country, are so enamored with this ignorant, noble savage vision of the United States Negro life, especially that when you don't accept that vision of yourself or of a group of people or of American life, you, you just, you can't, you will not be empowered enough to make an actual difference. Now you can affect a kid or two now and then, but for every kid you affect, the television is gonna come on and there's gonna be somebody grabbing themselves. And, I, and it's not that I'm prudish about that. I really, I grew up in New Orleans. I could care less about you want to pull yourself out in the public, you want cuss. Or, but it's just the, the message that it sends to kids is so titillating and it's such a powerful message of vulgarity and ignorance that a lot of times when I go to schools, I have to tell ki teach kids uh, and inner city kids just about having manners. I, I don't even get to music. <laughs> you know, it's I just courtesy. say, well, look, courtesy. just when you see somebody, you say thank you or you look at somebody and you don't have to scowl at them. You say good morning because it's not tied into being poor. Because the, the Afro-American people in the United States of America have a tradition of economic impoverishment, but uh, the tradition of uh, vulgarity and harshness toward each other and a type of just disrespectful behavior that I see going on in, in American culture in general was, was not really a feature of our culture. And that is the thing that I try to influence kids, black and white kids, more to. It's just the black kids need it more because they are being victimized more by media imagery. Like every time you see the image of somebody who's of African American, it's always either some crime or the Negro did this. Or, and the, the good stories where the people are trying to do something, they're not played no, up no, that no, much. No, no. And this thing inspires a type of negative behavior. Yeah. How much do you blame the music, contemporary music, though, I in please, terms of the, the lyrics that are coming out of? You know, it's not the lyrics, it's the music. It's really? just that incessant beat. And, and the, the tragedy is like what Albert Murray would always tell me, the same thing that liberate can enslave. That backbeat that comes out of the church music, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't represent anything that it represented in the church music. Now you take an African music or the traditional music, the person who was the custodian of the groove is the one who knows the most about the history of the people because they recognize that these grooves and these beats have a power over the, the human psyche. And that is the power of music. But in our society, we associate the meaning of music only with words. Well, the music itself, without words, carries much greater meaning than music with words. The words actually temper, yeah, right. you know, they temper the music. Temper, right. So when you have boom, bap, boom, bap, boom, bap, all day this beat goes on on television, yeah. all night. And this beat has a, it is a sound in that beat that I, I really, I don't, I'm uncomfortable with and that what sound. Is it? Because it is, it's a sound first of a lack of engagement because a groove uh, is a lot of different parts that interact. Mm -hmm. the, in this beat, the parts don't interact at all. It's just a repetition of the same thing. It's something that, that represents a certain type of sexuality. Like the American music came up with certain rituals of courtship and the, the popular music is very hard to separate from romance. Now the secular music, which is the blues, which has very little to do with romance, but which, which is the tawdry side of human nature, even that has an interactive type of quality. And when in American music, the beats and the grooves of the music itself become non-interactive, so much so that machines can play it, and the actual human involvement in the creation of the music and the, the dialogue that goes on it is reduced to nothing, it actually defeats it, it doesn't nourish the public, then it takes away. It exploits the public, and that is largely what that music is designed for, to get the money and to titillate the young people and stamp on whatever conception of romance they could have developed. And at the end of their broken dreams is just the type of vulgarity, the fake informality that comes about as a, as a result of a lack of romance and style and sophistication. That's why you see so much vulgarity in the youth, disrespect for anything of, for civilization, and it's tied into this sound. And, and so, uh, do you think it's too late? It's never too late. I never think. And it's how too do late. you take the first step, or the second step, or the third step? Just what we're doing right now. Just, just by talk saying about it. this is not this. It, it won't be popular. What you're saying? Like I've been out here 12 years saying the same thing. Yeah. It'll be attacked. But I always feel that what will happen is that those 
who are making the most money and becoming popular and celebrated over this will become so arrogant that at some point they will step over a line that people are not going to tolerate any further. And I find that coming rapidly with this increase in murdering and killing and hatred. Right, but let me, let me understand who you're talking about, too. Are you, I mean, are, we, are you talking about a blanket sort of condemnation of rap music? No, I'm not talking about rap. First, rap music, I don't separate from the larger progression in American popular music. Yeah. Like the, the whole progression of rock and the whole thing in American consciousness which tells you that music means that you rebel against basic conceptions. Right. Whereas in Afro-American music was always about affirmation of democracy. Whereas the conception of rock music was always kick some mic stands down, blow something up, a certain, a certain genre of rock. Cuss somebody out, be a rebel, a rebel without a cause. Well, that's what it is. It's fraudulent. So the extension of that philosophy is rap music. But people have erroneously associated that with race. So now they say this is black music. But the Afro-American musical persona is not that. That's, that comes more out of, out, of, out of the rock persona. So I don't separate. I, I, and, I, and I think that it's a blanket thing. That It's something that exists in all of American society, and we are all responsible. I'm responsible for this also. I don't feel like I can say it's the rapper's fault or it's the, the fault of the record companies because once a system is in place, everybody participates in it. It's like the slave system. You know, you, you, you're going to say somebody who worked on a slave ship in 18, yeah. in 1765, he had his children, his wife, his family, he had this to feed was wrong for important slaves, which had been imported for whatever the amount of years. And you can say it, but that wasn't going to keep this man from, from working his job. He might have felt it was wrong. It's like these grown men who make these videos with these people doing all this right. ignorance and insanity. Right. A lot of them look at it and say, man, you know, but that's their job. Yeah. So it's just a system that uh, I, I feel that we have to attack verbally, publicly, People have to stand up against this type of, of ignorance. And, and, and have you, are you taking this message to Washington or anywhere? I take it everywhere I go. Yeah. And, and not just talking, just the way I attempt to carry myself as a man. When I talk to these kids, I try to talk to them with respect, and I try to, to get them to understand that it's And so unreal. suppose one of them raises a hand in one of these, where you're speaking, and somebody says, hey, man, you're, you're talking about Madonna, and you're talking about Michael Jackson, and you're talking about a lot of people who are pop icons in America today. Well, they do do that. They do. They do. They, they, they say worse than heroes. that. They yeah. say you're attacking us. Yeah. And my, my answer to that is, so? So? I mean, that's... The shoe fits. You know, it's like, like Freud said, many enemies, much glory. <laughs> <laughs> like, just at a certain point, you have to say, no, you know, th this is not what I feel should be going on. And that's part of the dialogue that is a part of democracy. Yeah. Why are you different? I mean, are you parents? No, I don't really think that I'm that different. I just think that I speak for a voice of people who are out there, but they aren't in the media that much. Yeah. Like it was a, I got publicity like kind of out of a mistake. <laughs> you know, once yeah, you get some because publicity, you were good at what you did. Yeah, kind of. And then you start to get publicity and, you, and you, you talk. But I see thousands of teachers, parents, kids. Like when I'm walking on the street in New York, sometimes somebody will just say, you know, keep talking, baby, or keep the bebop alive. Or I think of all the people I meet around the country who work with students every day, and they're struggling, and they're not going to be on the on Charlie Rose show. But well, I, so maybe they will. But <laughs> some of them. You here? Yeah, I'm here. But you know they yeah. they they're out here working and struggling with these problems all the time. Yeah. Let me go back to to the relationship here. To to what about religion? Are you religious? Not not in the organized sense. Yeah. Is there competition between you and Bradford, or are you d d just no. brotherly love? No, we, we do, what we're doing is so different. Yeah. You know, that we don't really... How would you characterize what you do as being different? Well, I'm out here all the time playing. Right. And trying to swing and right. play the jazz music. Right. He's more, he's playing on a television show every night for the commercials. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when he'll play, like, whatever, if he gets a job, he'll play it. Yeah. It's kind of, we always, like, have the, we always have the same kind of persona. Like, I'm, I'm out here trying to represent the culture a certain way. He, just, he likes to play music, yeah. and he has Where a Where are time. you trying to take the music, if anywhere? Just, I'm, I'm not trying to take it anywhere. I'm just trying to represent the music and try to... First, I'm trying to understand what the music is, myself. You are trying to understand jazz? Yes, it's complex. And, and as I understand it and educate myself, I try to pass the same joys and feelings and, and things that I get for my discovery of it on to the people who are interested in, in hearing it. Yeah. Now, this conversation is not over, but, but, but here, I look at this new album, Wenton Marsalis with Judith Lynn Stillman on the 20th century, in, in which uh, 
uh, Ravel and Martha Honecker and, and uh, a whole bunch of other people, Leonard Bernstein and, and Eugene Boza. What's this about? Well, it's just 20th century trumpet sonatas. And it's the type of music that you hear when you go to recitals and yeah. hear, hear people play. Like if you play in high school, you have to give your senior recital, you play that. So these are uh, some of the great? Some of them, like two or three of them. Some of them are just nice pieces, yeah. like the Ravel piece. And the Hindemith is a great piece. But uh, who, uh, I, th this is a locker room question, but I'd ask you this if you and I were sitting in the green room here talking about Excluding yourself, you know, I mean, who, and, and let's exclude Ar Louis Armstrong, okay? Who else did, did you really think uh, ought to belong on the top five, on the first team of oh, trumpet man, players? So many people. You mean just in jazz? Yeah. Um, I have to say uh, Roy Eldridge, Dizzy Gillespie, Miles Davis when he played jazz. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just heard that new album with, from Montreal with Quincy. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know that's, what? That's unfortunate. Right. Uh, What's unfortunate? Just, you know, just sometimes you make decisions in, in your life. And well, that, that what? That Miles left jazz or, or, or was taking it somewhere just, else rather than... No, it's just a certain type of spiritual decay becomes evident when you make decisions. Right. Whether you're Miles Davis or Wynton Marcellus or whoever you are. Yeah. And that's something that's been chronicled in the history of art. It's a right. famous story in, in art of somebody who's endowed with a gift and they decide to use the charisma and their gift in another way than, than what they were endowed with, it either because of the fame or because of the money, because of the disappointment in what people do. Yeah. How, you know, it's like the story in the Bible of Moses in the promised land. Yeah. Uh, after he did all of that, just because he didn't do what he was told to do one time, he didn't get to see the promised land. It's a story. You know, he says, well, uh, strike the rock or something, he cast a, he cast a rod down and God said, no, that, that's not what yeah. you were supposed to do. So after all of that, all of what Moses did, still, uh, this is what he had to deal with. And that's just one story. I'm not saying that to plug a religion. I have to always say that because yeah. you know, everybody is so paranoid about, about, about religions and the Bible and everything. But it's a story of heroism. The fact that when you're given something, you have that, that the thing on you and your personality gets enriched by that struggle. Yeah. Yeah. And when you turn your back on it, something different yeah. happens. What have you wanted to do that you haven't been able to do? I mean, is there an orchestra you wanted to play with? Oh, is there many things? You know, I'm greedy. Well, give me I, one. Well, I always wanted to have a big band. Yeah. And and play with them. And I always wanted to be surrounded you, by. I, I went in Marsala's band. Yeah, or just any. It doesn't even have to be my band. Just to play with a band full of musicians who are all equally serious. Yeah. Like and who all really want to swing and play jazz and develop yeah. the music. Is everybody. anybody doing that anywhere? Not on the level that I'm talking about. I mean, in, in younger, terms of that quality of the modern jazz quartet and Betty Carter and their musicians out yeah. who still play. Why, like why that. can't you do it? Because a lot of what my aspirations are t tied into my generation. So I have to wait for guys to 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 come up who want to play. I have to wait for people to learn the history of music a certain way. I have to hope that it's a certain level of seriousness there. Yeah. I have to, and it's hard for younger people to want to play jazz because there are very few jobs and it's very difficult to learn how to play things like the blues in this particular era. How many members of an orchestra would there be? 16 or 17. 16 or 17. We got you and we got Marcus Roberts, right? <laughs> right. right? That's two. Oh, we no, I, I know. That, I mean, I'm going to put musician. together a band this summer to, to go out yeah, and play. But, but there are other things. Like, I would like to be teaching a high school and have an orchestra, like to play the classics of Beethoven yeah. and conduct them and then have a jazz band too. But you, next summer you're going to put together a band? Yes. Yeah. Why do you wait for the summer? Because you got other obligations? Well just because it's hard. I have to have the work a certain way, I have to have the time to write arrangements, I have to get it all organized the way I want it. All right. And the ballet continues to tour? Yes. Yeah, we're going to tour for this month, for October, this month. October. Yeah. October. And you got this new album out and there's another album coming out too, isn't it? Right. Well, it's, it's a, uh, I mentioned that too. You're going to release two CDs, In This House on This Morning, which I sacred music, jazz inspired by the Afro-American church. Right. I, I, that's, I'd rush out to get that. And then you got this one. Is there another one? Man, this is so many. I've got like uh, eight or nine in the can. They'll come I know you do. You, you're actually, you're way ahead, aren't you? They're yeah, just waiting them. to release them. Yeah. Went Marsalis, my friend. Uh, pleasure to have you here. Hey, man. Good to see Always you. Thank you. Always. You're carrying the message. Uh, thank you. We'll be right back.